sehash ta se ta sehash che che khistat na het de omatam histo jamal far so far from the earth that is home the very air foreign smelling of salt and fish choking the breath out of you listen you can hear the waves what is this place so far from home surely this is the first river in our journey across the four great rivers to sea the path to mahia the place beyond i saw 72 big indians yesterday proper men they were weary and greatly worn but as they stepped out of the cars of the train and folded their blankets about them there was a large dignity about their movements that made me desire to salute their grave excellencies sydney lanier st agustin florida 1875 the united states army has brought as prisoners of war the most dangerous of the cheyenne arapaho kiowa cattle Comanche Fort Marion a place devoid of feeling wet moss covered walls as thick and as high as ancient cottonwood dark dank rooms I find the arrival of the Indians both troubling and interesting the decision to imprison them in the old Spanish fort is deplorable It is as unfit for them as they are for it. The pain of homesickness and hopelessness haunted their movements. Their shorn hair shameful. Each mourned as they prepared for death. For now, the confinement. Perhaps this was the end of the journey until they met Mahale. Without understanding, these warrior prisoners seek comfort in memories of home the leg irons curious stares and strange food haunt them as they search for answers to silent questions how will our people know their way home 33 Cheyenne people made the unholy journey across the country with captain Richard Pratt including Bear's Heart Minimic Coho Medicine Water than his wife, buffalo calf woman, Moki. There were other women at Fort Marion, wives coming with their men. But Moki was the only Native American prisoner of war. With nothing to do but remember, the prisoners turned their sorrow into sketches, ledger drawings, so called because they were drawn in ledger accounting books. Here was one link to the past. a way to remember who and what they were personal pictures of a way of life few whites had seen not everyone made drawings moki's story survived through oral family history this is my story as i would tell my grandchildren and they would tell their grandchildren the spirits of the men and women who touched this land who molded it with their sweat their tears and their laughter are the threads woven into our lives today they are our rocky mountain legacy Once the Tististas were hunters and gatherers not the warlike nomads of their reputation they had permanent villages grew corn made pottery living in harmony with the earth then the Europeans came and the Tististas departed from their native lands around the great lakes known by their Lakota name Cheyennes This was not a mass exodus, but rather each band moving then another and another to get away from the guns of the French traders, 
Ultimately, as if foretold, the Cheyenne arrived in short grass country, now known as North Dakota. There they met the Kiowa, Ojibwa, Cree. And then they all would say around 1810, 1820, the Sioux people kept coming and coming, and then uh, the old ones say that they had a dispute eventually, and the Cheyenne moved on out to the Yellowstone country. Historians have insisted the Cheyenne migrated to chase the buffalo. I've heard the old ones say that wasn't the main reason. The Cheyenne had lots of horses, and they had to move to keep the horse herds and good grass. And, you know, a horse will eat down to the root and pull the root and and of course with the millions of buffalo they had to move all the time to keep a good pasture for the horse because that was our main mode of uh, transportation at the time a prophet rose up among the testistas bringing new teachings Sweet medicine told of things to come. When the time of hunger came, sweet medicine left the people and lived four years in Bear Butte, the holy mountain. You live the way I have taught you and follow the sacred arrows. You must not forget them, for they will give you strength and the ability to take care of yourselves. There is a time when many things will change. Strangers will appear among you. Their skins are light colored and they will outnumber you. Their words will be strange. The buffalo will disappear and another animal will take its place. A slick haired animal with long tail and split hoof. First there will be another animal you must learn to use. It has a shaggy neck, its hooves are round. This animal will carry you on his back and help you in many ways. So fear him not. Do not forget the sacred arrows. I have seen these things, and you will find that they will come true. Sweet medicine. And so it was. Tististas met the Spanish, the white man, naming him Vejo, spider because his clothes were little woven spider webs. Much later, the Cheyenne would learn that the spider was also a trickster, full of deceit. For now, Vejo appeared to be a friend. The fur traders followed the Spanish. The Bent Boys, along with Saran St. Vrain, established a trading fort along the Arkansas River, named Fort William, but known to all as Bent's Fort. Here was the first consistent contact with the whites, trading buffalo robes for flour, sugar, metal, beads. William Bent, more than a friend, a brother, one to seek in counsel. Little white man, as he was called, married into the Tististas. The plains around the Arkansas River were regular campsites for the Cheyenne. Each season they would stay longer and longer, hunting buffalo, raiding the massive horse herds of the Comanche and Kiowa, trading at the adobe fort, until some called it home dividing the people into the North Platte and the Arkansas Tististas. We have two different tribes of Cheyenne. Their dialect is a little different because of the naming of the objects that came with the white man when he came to this country that we had no name for. For instance, we didn't have any coffee. When the white man came, we had to think a little bit to dig up a name for coffee. So we call it black soup, same as oatmeal. We never had oatmeal. We didn't ever grow any oats. So we call it slobber gravy because of its consistency. When you spoon it up out of a bowl, it's kind of thick. So we call it slobber gravy. Sugar, call it sweet water. Of course, light bread was called white man's bread. Whiskey, white man's water. When life began, Mahale made the earth and gave us all things. We wore the skin of the four-legged, 
for Maheo gave us the buffalo and all animals to enable us to survive. We would sneak up on hands and knees, softly, until within a hundred steps, then we would rise on our knee and shoot him. The women sliced the meat and hung it to dry. They dried the hides too and scraped them with sharp stones until they grew soft. Standing bird. A nomadic life. In springtime, moving to the communal summer camp. In the time of the freezing moon, moving to the winter camp. Each group of lodges like family extended kinship where cousins were brothers. Their mothers and grandmothers taught the ways of the tististas, made the meals, kept the lodge, and the grandfathers and fathers met in council. The tististas were the new neighbors on the plains, taking their share of the buffalo, the antelope. Then, gold was discovered in California, and nothing would ever be the same again. The Tististas learned to keep their distance from the whites when their people began dying of cholera. One Cheyenne warrior canted as he made medicine against the white man's sickness. If I could see this thing, if I knew where it was, I would go there and kill it. Gold seekers and army men are an untrusting lot. Fearful that the fighting between the tribes would delay travel to the gold fields, the government chose to treat with the Plains tribes, every one of them. 1851, during the Great Horse Treaty, that's what the Cheyenne know it as, because the old ones say that's the reason they call it Horse Creek was that's the first place they seen a tame horse. Grandfather and father, I am glad to see so many Indians and whites meeting in peace. I am glad you have taken pity on us. The buffalo used to be plenty in our country, but is getting scarce. I know you will tell me, right, and it must be good for me and my people. If all the nations here were willing to do what you tell them, then we could sleep in peace. We would not have to watch our horses and our lodges in the night. Old bark. As a result of the Treaty of 1851, the Tististas now had boundaries to their hunting grounds. Commencing at the place where the road leaves the North Fork of the Platte River to its source, thence along the main range of the, the Rocky, Rocky Mountains, Mountains to the headwaters of the Arkansas River, thence down the Arkansas River to the crossing of the Santa Fe Road, road. Thence, Thence northwesterly north to the forks of the Platte River and up to the place of the beginning, Fort Laramie Treaty, 1851. The government would build roads, forts, and military posts, while ownership of the land remained in the hands of the various tribal nations. The government got what they wanted, safe passage for the 49ers to California. Tististas a lights on cloud white antelope and little chief travel to Washington City, a place the old ones called Washdine, to meet with the great white father and sign a peace treaty with the Pawnee. A lights on cloud, the legendary iron shirt, carried himself with honor across the country. Later, when President Fillmore told them it was improper to smoke in front of the ladies, he refused to sign the treaty. Before the decade was out, gold was found at the confluence of the South Platte and Cherry Creek rivers, and thousands of emigrants made their way to Pikes Peak region. Here they were, these whites, crisscrossing the prairies in endless numbers, right through the hunting lands of the Tististas. Settlements became towns, then there were saloons and lawyers and shopkeepers. I say the first pilgrim that landed Plymouth Rock had three items on his person. He had the Bible, shotgun, and pound of whiskey. One of those items would get him a home. If it failed, he'd try the next one. Maybe use all three, but it got him a home.
Slowly, the ancient cottonwoods begin to disappear. Cattle chewed the grass into the ground, and the buffalo grew scarce. Sweet Medicine's prophecy was coming true. The lodges of the Cheyenne and Arapaho continued to overlook the Cherry Creek and South Platte rivers. Watching the frenzy with which the whites embraced everything, the land, the gold, the whiskey. It must have been a curious sight to a people used to greeting each day as it came. Arapaho Chief Little Raven summed up the feelings of many. Take the gold, but remember, the land belongs to us, and don't stay too long. Then a group of drunken whites raped several women in the Arapaho village while their men were gone, and the people had a hint of things to come. William Bent, friend and Indian agent, warned Washington to rescue you, the Indians and withdraw them from contact with the whites. These Indians are compressed into a small circle of territory, destitute of food and bisected by a constantly marching line of emigrants. There is no alternative but to exterminate them, which the dictates of justice and humanity alike forbid. A.B. Greenwood, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, 1859. Like a wildfire, the idea of land ownership spread. The purchase of Indian title to all the lands embraced within the contemplated territory would be perhaps the surest, if not the only course, to ensure friendly relations. Commissioner Greenwood called for a treaty council at Fort Wise in the fall of 1860. Agreement is elusive. In the end, it boiled down to what the whites wanted. The Indians will be put in some locality where they will not interfere with our manifest destiny. February 8, 1861. The Treaty of Fort Wise sets aside a reservation for the Arapaho and the Cheyenne, surveyed and divided so that each person receives 40 acres. Additionally, the treaty provided for the purchase of the land on which Denver City stood at the going rate of $1.25 an acre. Later, the treaty is amended, and the purchase of Denver City never made. To the indignation of the settlers, the Cheyenne and the Arapaho were not ready to settle down on the small, gameless reserve. Instead, bands continued to follow the diminishing buffalo, becoming increasingly defensive. We will protect our way of life and drive the whites from our country. Bull Bear, Dog Soldier. From the day of his arrival in the territory, Governor John Evans seemed anxious about the Cheyenne and the Arapaho. Like most newcomers, Evans saw danger with each gathering. At Fort Lyon, Silas Sewell felt the feelings of the governor. The fort command receives a stream of orders from the governor, but they all add up to let them starve. Evans became a stumbling block, unable to keep appointments, unable to find field notes generally standing in the way of the allotment of the land of the tribal nations, seeing ghosts and danger at every turn. I am informed that a large party of Arapaho Indians are camped at the Cache a la Puter. They may have gone too far already. John Evans. Meanwhile, on the plains of Kansas Territory, Lieutenant George Iyer and his Colorado volunteers encounter a Cheyenne hunting party. Iyer orders his men prepare for battle. Two Cheyenne shout a greeting. The young lieutenant, perhaps with his first encounter, opens fire, killing Chief Lean Bear and Star. The encounter reported as a war party of 400. Tempers flare. The Cheyenne are enraged and retaliate. Lieutenant Iyer is sent to find and kill the savages, burning villages along the way. Preacher turned Civil War hero. John Shivington orders an attack on 12 unsuspecting Arapaho lodges, killing many. Retribution is fast and swift. Chief Big Mouth's warriors coming upon the Hungate homestead south of Denver kill the homesteaders. Wade Hungate finds his wife and children, heads nearly severed, before he himself is killed. And the die is cast. The Cheyenne are blamed, and Governor Evans has all the proof he needs. Evans Wire's War Department. Indian hostilities commenced. One settlement devastated 25 miles east of here. 
Our troops near all gone. Shall I call a regiment of 100 day men? In camps all over the territory, men signed on as Indian fighters. The governor issues a written proclamation urging the friendly Indians to go to Fort Lyon while mobilizing the citizens to go in pursuit of all hostile Indians, kill and destroy wherever they may be found. The conflict is upon us, and all good citizens are called upon to do their duty. Major Edward Winecoop, commander at Fort Lyon, looking for peace, brings a delegation of Cheyenne and Arapaho to Denver. Governor Evans and Colonel Shivington refuse to meet. Finally, they reluctantly agree to meet outside Denver, at Camp Weld. All we ask is that we may have peace with the whites. We want to hold you by the hand. You are our father. We want to take good tidings home to our people, that they may sleep in peace. Black Kettle. With much discussion about who killed the Hungates, who fought with the soldiers, the delegates answer every charge. Governor Evans consistently trying to agitate. Major Weinkoop's peace effort jeopardized the governor's plan to kill the hostiles, leading Evans to replace him at Fort Lyon with Major Scott Anthony. In reality, behind closed doors, Governor Evans said, I've already wired for permission to form a volunteer group to annihilate all the Indians. Therefore, I said, tell these people, let's go camp wherever they want to. They're going to be killed anyhow. The Cheyenne traveled to the shelter of Fort Lyon, expecting to find a friend. They are met by Major Anthony, who immediately sends them away from the fort. Black Kettle makes camp along the Big Sandy with War Bonnet, Lone Bear, Sand Hills, White Antelope. In all, 100 lodges assemble. The Cheyenne calls Sand Creek Bono. And Cheyenne means dry creek, no water. The old folks say there was no water there. 24 hours before their enlistment time is up, the 100 dayers finally march. At Fort Lyon, Shivington finds Major Anthony enthusiastic about the surprise attack on the Sand Creek encampment. His officers, however, have to be bullied and abused. Their desire is to protect the Cheyenne. Forty miles as the crow flies, the lodges at the Big Sandy prepared for another cold night. At 9 p.m., the order came to move out. November 29, 1864. The morning breaks to a gray sky. The frosty wind gently rustles the remaining leaves of fall. Silently, the serenity broken. Listen, the pony herds are acting up. The village dogs are barking. Mother hears it too. Mukas, do you hear that? It must be a large buffalo herd. Father runs into the lodge, shouting, Quick, come look. After they set up the guns on the bluff, Shivington stirs his men. I don't tell you to kill all ages and sex, but look back on the plains of the Platte where your mothers, fathers, brothers, and sisters have been slain. The sight is frightening. They're on a ridge to the west, or soldiers watching, like a large blue Shishinov snake, uncoiling, menacing. From our place in Bumpin' Wolf's camp, we see old Chief White Antelope come out of his lodge, also Mahdavida Black Kettle. They call out to remain calm. Black Kettle raises the American flag that he received in Denver and a white flag also. So the soldiers will know that we are friendly. A rain of bullets and cannon fire fall on us. Explosion after explosion rip our lodges. Pieces of hide and dirt and belongings fly through the air. Above the roar of the guns, I hear the screams of my family. Chief White Antelope shouts in the language of the Vithu, Stop! Stop! As I watch, I am sure I hear the death song. 
they shoot him. Then, one of the soldiers dismounts and grabbing White Antelope's hair, makes a cut. He holds in his hand the fresh cut scalp. The soldier rips the clothing and cuts away the private manhood. Almost within a single breath, mother, father, grandfather fall. I'm grabbing for them. Nimihuts, my husband, standing bow, is slaughtered, protecting me. I want to die. I want to live. I want to die. Too numb to think, I reach for father's buffalo gun. I will run. I will run. I must fight. Running hard. The freezing smoke-filled air singes my So they continue firing on these Indians who numbered about a hundred until they almost completely destroyed them. The boots are like wind blowing past me. I've never seen men fight so bravely. I saw three Indians charge not less than 150 men. They came within four yards, firing their revolvers and arrows until they were shot down. Major Scott Anthony. Black Kittle watches as his Cheyenne people are killed. In his heart, Coyote calls. It is time to run and save the people you can save. Come after me. I know the way out. Follow the earth along the left-hand fork of Sandy Creek. Call who can be called and follow me. Standing atop a cliff, Captain Silas Sewell holds back his men. Never in his young life has he had to stand so firm, feel so hopeless. Never has this young officer felt the choking sear of human fear so acutely or looked shame so squarely in the eye. It wasn't an army. It was a mob. I flat refused to order in my men or open fire. Without thinking, we dig in the sandy earth, making holes to get away from the bullets and to make a stand. And then, it was night. We crawled out of the holes, stiff and sore, with blood frozen on our wounded and half-naked bodies. Slowly, painfully, we retreated up the creek. George bent. Colonel Shivington prepared his report to General Curtis. I, at daylight, attacked Cheyenne villages of 130 lodges from nine to 10 hundred warriors strong. More than half of us are wounded and all are on foot. We stop in a ravine for the night. It is so cold. We cover ourselves with grass to keep warm. Killed Chief's Black Kettle, White Antelope, No Te Ni and Little Robe, and between four and five hundred other Indians. Our loss, nine killed, 38 wounded. November 29th, 1864, Colonel John M. Shivington. Major Scott Anthony tallied differently. Our loss in killed and wounded in the great battle was very near as many as there were armed Indians in the camp. 13 dead and 38 wounded. Sleep does not come easily. We remember our mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, our babies so brutally murdered, lying alone on the ground, cold, with the soldiers doing unspeakable things to them. This day, I vow revenge for the murder of my family and my people. This day, I declare war on Vihe, white man. Moki is my great-great-grandmother. She was born in 1844, Yellowstone country, Wyoming. She was 20 years old at Sand Creek. This day, I become a warrior, and a warrior I will be forever. She knew of no other way to handle losing all her family but to fight back, the old one said. The words of White Antelope's death song would become mine. Nothing lives long, only the earth and the mountains.
As Moki dedicated herself to the memory of her people, soldiers were ransacking the village, collecting buffalo robes, deerskin shirts, and creating for themselves other trophies from the body parts of the dead. Once satisfied, they burned the lodges. The only prisoners, two children found after the battle and taken back to Denver by men of the third. November 29, 1864, the battle at Sand Creek. To the Cheyenne, this day would be forever Bono Yachit, the Sand Creek Massacre. 148 Cheyenne dead, only 60 were men. As dawn broke, the soldiers marched south while the Cheyennes continued their flight north. They went back to the Smoky Hill River area with the dog soldiers where the arrows were during Sand Creek. That little strip of Kansas was, they considered it dog soldier country. and That's where basically they ended up. Their arrival in the camp met with tears and warmth. Blankets and food and comfort for the survivors. Chief Black Kettle, his shame as big as the earth, also arrives to taunts and jeers. His faith in whites led to the murder of women, women and children. children. Why did you not stay at Sand Creek and die, die with, with your, your brother? brother? You are an old fool. There are no thoughts of peace now. The whites had declared war on them, and in anger, they would strike back. The Smoky Hill camp was full of warriors, many of them dog soldiers one of the war societies. Everyone clamored for war, even the women. When Sand Creek occurred, it was in a cold time, you know, a winter time. Yet, when they sent the war pipes out, I think that's the first time that they ever sent the war pipes out to get someone to ally with them and fight with them. And uh, the first ones to pick up the pipes were the Lakota, Lower Brule Sioux. Within days, the Cheyenne, along with the Spotted Tail Sioux, Pawnee Killer Sioux, and the Northern Arapaho, had declared war against the United States. The alliance of tribes which Governor Evans feared was now a reality. The efforts of peace chiefs were for naught. Caught between the dog soldiers and the warring whites and the teachings of sweet medicine. Though your son might be killed in front of your lodge, you should take your sacred pipe and smoke it and pray to the Creator, Mahel, sweet medicine. Peace Chief's White Antelope, Yellow Wolf, Standing in Water, Lone Bear, Bumping Wolf, perished at Sand Creek. As they mourned for their dead, an exhausted and discouraged black kettle and a small band too weary to fight moved south towards the Arkansas. While at Fort Lyon, John Shivington bragged about the defeat he had handed the Cheyennes Arapahoes. Brilliant thing, which will make me a brigadier general, or put a star on my shoulders. At first glance, the Fort Command seemed in sympathy with the Cheyennes. We here feel wronged by his action. He has whipped the only peaceable Indians in the country. Major Scott Anthony. The Major's displeasure with the Colonel only thinly veiled in his letter to his brother. I am inclined to think the Colonel dare not risk a longer trip into hostile Indian country for fear he could not get promoted before reports were published showing his foolish action in that affair. He has, with inside of them, turned back with the largest and best outfitted command that ever went against Indians in this locality. Within the month, the proud citizens of Denver City would welcome their war hero and his men. Headed by the 1st Regiment Band and by Colonels Shivington and Shoup, the rank and file of the bloody Thirdsters made a most imposing procession. Although covered o'er with dust, the boys looked bully. Rocky Mountain News, December 22, 1864. The soldiers arrived with their trophies to a nearly circus-like atmosphere. Cheyenne scalps are getting as thick here as toads in Egypt. Everybody has got one and is anxious to get another one to send to the east. 
The men of the third sold beaded deerskin shirts and dresses for a mere $20 apiece. The town was alight with Indian fever. The Denver Theater offering the great Indian drama. A full and fashionable audience were at the Denver Theater last night. The play was put upon the stage in splendid style with numerous novel trappings and trophies of the big fight at Sand Creek. As though bore on the wind, the seeds of conscience were sprouting. By the end of the year, Washington was alive with rumors that Sand Creek was not a glorious field of battle. The affair at Fort Lyon, Colorado Territory, in which Colonel Shivington destroyed a large Indian village and all its inhabitants, is to be made the subject of a congressional investigation. December 20th, 1864, Washington City. The real reason was for selfishness. The land that they occupied was their home. They thought the Great Spirit put them there to live there from now on, which of course was true. But the white man wanted that land for his own use. He didn't care about civilization or progress, only the land. The War Department wanted the Indians out of uh, Colorado, the uh, territory of Colorado, and the War Department uh, gave orders to General uh, Curtis out of Kansas. And General Curtis and Shepherdson were good friends. I want no peace till the Indians suffer more, General Curtis. By the end of the year, 2,000 warriors had assembled along the Platte River preparing for war against the whites. Charles and George Bent joined the dog soldiers as warriors. January 7th, 1865. During the moon of the strong wind, 1,000 Cheyenne, Sioux, and Arapaho warriors attacked the small army camp and stage stop at the mouth of the Lodgepole Creek, Julesburg, killing 15 soldiers and looting the stage stop, taking food and provisions for their horses. The shopkeeper fled in haste, leaving the payroll strong box behind. The warriors chop the little green paper and throw it like confetti, except for George Bent who stuffed his pockets with a great deal of money. Among the warriors, Moki and Medicine Water, feeling revenge, yet sensing in sorrow for the loss of the soul of the land. The white man has taken our country, killed our buffalo, was not satisfied with that, but killed our wives and children. Now, no peace. We have raised the war cry until death, leg in the water. The whole Indian country between the Platte and the Arkansas River was ablaze with war paint and fight. Up and down the Platte, capturing wagon trains, destroying telegraph lines, interrupting mail delivery, freight service. And so it would be for the next 12 years. The Sand Creek Massacre is perhaps the foulest and most unjustifiable crime. But for that horrible butchery, it is a fair presumption that all subsequent wars with the Cheyenne and Arapaho might have been averted. General Nelson Miles. The lives of warriors were as ordinary as those of settlers hunting food, worshipping, making tools, playing with the family, trading. The old ones taught a young medicine water to respect his elders, to be peaceful with others, and to learn to make arrows. For if one, one does, does not make arrows, arrows, he will borrow moccasins, leggings, and robes, and be disliked. A man must be energetic and full of life. If you are not, your blanket will be ragged, and your moccasins will be full of holes. Within the village, there were a few women warriors, like Moki. They had their own medicine women, their own way to prepare for battle, all the while keeping the lodge, having babies, paying attention to passing on the traditions. Moki sang her own songs, painted her own war shield, made her own medicine, all taught to her by the old ones. To make medicine was to enter into a time of fasting, prayer, thanksgiving and self-denial. A warrior wanted to subdue the passions of the flesh, to cleanse the soul, 
get into conformity with Mahel. Even the way a warrior dressed for battle was part of the medicine. The preparation is for death. Every warrior wants to look his best when he goes to meet the creator. Wooden leg. The war horse played a vital part in all of this. She only would have used the horse for war. It was tied, it was kept separate, it was never mixed with the other herds, it was kept away. And there was a certain way that she tied the tail, a certain way that the tail was, it could have been braided, it could have been tied down with eagle feathers, and there was a certain harness that it wore. If she painted her horse, it was her own paints, her own design. It was just not get on the horse, let's go fight situation. It was a long process that she went through. He fights with me and fats with me. He knows my heart and I know his. We are brothers. I can look into his eyes and see his soul. At one time, warfare consisted of counting coop. With this coop stick, you rode by on a horse that's as fast as that horse could go and you struck the enemy on the head with that little coop stick. More or less like a fly swatter. That carried more honor than killing the enemy. However, against the white settlers, more than a coop stick was needed. Here were two cultures that absolutely did not understand each other. To the whites, the Plains tribes stood in the way of progress, in the way of civilization, they were merely tenants at will, like the buffalo or the antelope. To the Cheyenne, the settlers were out of sync with Mahale. It was uh, strange that when they gave the white man a place to live, that he fenced it immediately. They said it was peculiar that a person should do that. Why did he do that? They couldn't figure out why he wanted to put a fence around what little acreage they gave him to live on. But now, the ancient cottonwoods were disappearing. The mountains were bald where once great forests had grown. Once the buffalo herd stretched as far as the eye could see, now they were killed, wantonly, not for food, but for their hides. Treaty after treaty with these whites seemed for naught. They wanted the land, and that was that. As the government termed it, this affair at Fort Lyon opened a Pandora's box that would change the face of the West forever. Unless something is done to settle this trouble, our prospects are blasted for some time to come and the development of a rich mining country indefinitely postponed. J.B. Chaffee. After the uh, Sand Creek, well, they didn't, uh, the Cheyenne didn't trust anybody, especially the owners. They didn't trust the soldiers, didn't trust nobody. Yet, life goes on. Moki and Medicine Water found time to court, then marry. During the course of the next several years, babies were born to their lodge, and still, Moki and Medicine Water both rode as warriors. It's kind of unique that she was able to play all these roles. Mother, keeper of the lodge, able to cook and feed. And then if it came time to fight, she went to fight. In Denver City, another young man, Silas Sewell, carries with him the memories of Sand Creek. Dear Mother, Last November was a raid by Hunter Dares under Colonel Shivington to kill the Cheyennes at Sandy Creek. It was murder, pure and simple. It was a horrible scene, and I would not let my company fire. All my years out here, constant grinding down by death, how much is lost never to be retrieved. Silas isn't the only one with problems. The congressional investigation is underway and public sentiment is high. By all means, let there be an investigation, but we advise the Honorable Congressional Committee to get their scalps insured before they pass Plum Creek. So the testimony began. Everyone with any connection called. Governor Evans, Indian Agent Coley, Interpreter John Smith, Lieutenant Kramer, 
Major Anthony, and Silas Sewell. Dear Mother, I am reforming in regard to my bad habits, for I've kept off chewing tobacco and smoking a pipe, but I will smoke cigars when I can get them. I don't drink, so as you can see, I'm getting quite respectable and will stand a chance of getting a wife when I go down east. His reforming notwithstanding, Sai is the first called before the commission and for six days cross-examined. Moki and Medicine Water, along with other Cheyennes, Sioux and Arapaho, continue to press the white emigrant trains coming from the east. President Lincoln sends 8,000 troops to the west to fight the Indian Wars, unleashing a fury that will not end until a civilization is nearly destroyed before it is bent to fit into the white man's mold. The last half of my news is the best of all. Your son is a married man. Her name is Teresa Coberly, and everyone here calls her Hersa. I call her everlasting love of my life. When was it ever thus that a soldier who wouldn't pull a trigger wore such laurels? Silas's happiness isn't to last long. His fate sealed on that ridge overlooking Sandy Creek will call him in the dark of night. Our city was thrown into a feverish excitement last evening by the assassination of Captain S.S. Sewell of the Colorado First. The ball killed him instantly. The assassin dropped his pistol at the scene. A trail of blood led in the direction of the military camps. Today, in St. Paul's Church Episcopal, the rights for one whom many call their conscience gave those Denverites a chance to show their sympathy. Rocky Mountain News, April 27th, 1865. In the end, the Congressional Tribunal did little while assessing blame to Evans and Shivington and many of their officers. Shivington stood by his conduct, believing to the end that it was his destiny. Unless we settled this, we'd not survive to statehood. We were being held hostage by Stone Age savages who knew no law that anyone could understand. John Evans, with a style that would make any politician proud, avoided direct knowledge of anything. His testimony was characterized by such shuffling as has been shown by no witness examined for the evident purpose of avoiding admission that he was fully aware that the Indians massacred so brutally at Sand Creek were then and had been friendly toward whites. Statehood would not be helped by the massacre of the Cheyennes and would not become a reality for more than a decade. Medicine Water, Moki, and other Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Sioux warriors crisscrossed the plains. By October, another council was held, called the Treaty of the Little Arkansas. Again, the peace chiefs gathered. I once thought I was the only man that persevered to be the friend of the white man, but since they have come and cleaned out our lodges, horses, and everything else, it is hard for me to believe white men anymore. Black Kettle. I love the land and the buffalo and will not part with it. I want you to understand well what I say. Write it on paper. Let the great father see it. Kiowa Chief White Bear. The results? Another reservation. More land relinquished to the white man. But they could hunt and roam in the uninhabited parts of the country and the U.S. government would pay $40 a head for 40 years to each man, woman, and child who moved to the reservation, and a provision for retribution for the wrongs at Sand Creek. The sticking point would be a provision that the Smoky Hill area of Kansas be relinquished. The peace was stormy. The dog soldiers were willing, but had found whiskey traders. For all the rhetoric, not one thing really changed. Arriving in Colorado Territory, General William T. Sherman deemed the Indian trouble exaggerated. The Cheyenne and Arapaho are off after Buffalo. God only knows when, and I do not see how, we can make a decent excuse for an Indian war. Medicine Water and Moki joined other warriors, harassing small outposts of settlers, causing General Sherman to concede they must be exterminated, for they cannot and will not settle down, and our people will force us to it. 
the army continued to believe that might was the right of the white man. And the Cheyenne believed if they persevered, they could save the soul of the land. That the buffalo might roam forever. That their children's children might walk the same path as those who went before. Cheyennes continued to fight for their country. The soldiers continued to fight for their country. George Custer led the 7th Cavalry through the snow toward another showdown with the Cheyenne. Camped along the Washita River, Black Kettle's village lay sleeping that morning, the 27th of November, 1868, when the nightmare began again. Men, women, and children killed as they lay sleeping, including this time Chief Black Kettle and his wife. Perhaps it is true that history repeats itself. The strategy and outcome at the Washita seems frighteningly similar to Sand Creek. I know the elders of my family well enough that if I was to ask them if they thought that there were two people with the same kind of thoughts to fight, and, uh, you know, Shillington and Custer would have been two peas in a pod. The stories that we hear and the stories that we know about Sand Creek and Washita and other small incidents tend to want me to ask want me to ask who was a savage. Two cultures. Each thought the other was uncivilized. George Custer tried to understand the Plains tribes, but he did not. After the massacre on the Lodge Po River, or uh, the Washita River, as others know it, that following spring in March of 1869, Custer barged in on the arrow keeper's teepee where the sacred arrows were hanging and demanded to smoke. So the chiefs that went in there to smoke with him, the arrow keeper lit the pipe. Instead of passing the pipe like normally is done, they passed it behind them until it came to him. And instead of taking the four normal sacred puffs of the pipe and going through the procedure, he just went to smoking away. Well, the arrow keeper told him, if you ever come to war with the Cheyenne again, you're going to die. The continual defense of their country took a heavy toll on the Cheyenne. Where once they had been able to feed their families and subsist on buffalo, today they were nearly destitute. Amid all the atrocities created by both cultures stood a few men of great vision. Silas Sewell was one such man. The Cheyennes didn't get their lands or food or justice. What they got was slaughtered. Chief Black Kittle was another. Hoping only to prevent the extinction of his people from the crush of white civilization. The nightmare that was started at Sand Creek would not stop. By 1874, the dog soldiers had declined in numbers and the bowstring society had taken lead of the fight. Medicine Water as bowstring war chief called warriors from the other societies to join his efforts to stop the soldiers, to stop the buffalo hunters, to take back the plains. Moki rode at his side. When they brutally murdered the German family in Kansas and captured their children, the end was near. Although Moki and Medicine Water viewed the action as no different than Sand Creek or the Washita, the U.S. government saw it differently. Moki and Medicine Water were declared the most dangerous of the dangerous. After fighting for nearly 11 years, they secured the sacred arrows in a safe haven and surrendered to the soldiers at Fort Reno. Without trial or tribunal, they were loaded into rail cars and taken to St. Augustine, Florida, where they resided at Fort Marion as prisoners of war until their release in 1878. In 1881, surrounded by her family, Buffalo Calf woman, Moki, crossed the four great rivers to join Maheu and the land beyond. She was 41. So many people died that day at Sand Creek. 
It becomes part of who you are and why you have become. For the tististas, there will always be tears in the sand. The spirits of those who perished at Sand Creek live on each time we speak their names. White hat, bear skin, wounded bear, crow necklace, bear feathers, two lances, black wolf, white, white antelope, antelope, one eye, tall bear, feather head, tall wolf, heap of crows, spotted crow, standing water, Big head, red arm, sitting bear, big shell, Kiowa, wolf mule, white man, tall bull, black horse, yellow wolf, loser in the race, 